Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Hotelling, the administrative assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation. Rod Stutt is here to talk about Russia. Welcome. Okay, so this is a map of Russia as it is today. Uh, and it's very similar in a way to what Russia was uh, in medieval times. And you can see that with the size of Ukraine, um, Anyway, uh, what we're looking at are two cities, Moscow, which is located in the center, and St. Petersburg, which is up at the top on the Baltic Sea. And the location of these are very important. Moscow was the medieval capital, and as it was somewhat separated from Europe by these um, Eastern European countries, it was more of a Central Asian and, and Slavic uh, capital and associated more with um, the Balkan Peninsula and uh, Central Asian area. Uh, at this medieval times, uh, just like medieval France or England, uh, the um, sentiments were uh, very vicious and you had people such as Tsar Ivan the Terrible who seemed to be killing off all his relatives to prevent rivals to the throne. So, um, Peter the Great, who was in line for the throne as a young man, um, in order to avoid all of these political intrigues, uh, went to Western Europe to study. And uh, when he came back and ascended uh, to become Tsar of Russia, one of the first things he wanted to do was get out of the medieval times and to get into a uh, step with the Western part of Europe, which was in the Age of Enlightenment. And so he moved the capital from Moscow uh, to St. Petersburg, which is on the Baltic Sea. And remember in this era before railroads, if you were on a sea, you were on a main transportation and communications route to Western Europe. And so this was Russia's window on the West. And he rebuilt St. Petersburg as the capital of the country uh, on a model of Paris or Vienna and one of those other uh, very elegant cities. So it's got a very different character from medieval Moscow. Uh, the name St. Petersburg is uh, a Western name and, and that is its real name. It's uh, St. Petersburg, even when it's spelled in Cyrillic, uh, because he took the name uh, to uh, reflect uh, his patron saint as uh, uh, it would be expressed in German with the St. Petersburg rather than Petrograd. And uh, so uh, many people think that this is an anglicization, but it's actually the way the name is uh, pronounced and spelled in Russian. When the communists took over, they changed the name to Leningrad and they moved the capital back to Moscow. So Moscow, uh, in addition to its medieval roots, has a lot of Soviet era buildings and a lot of the more elegant buildings of the uh, reign of um, the uh, czars in St. Petersburg remain. So St. Petersburg still has this much more elegant character than the rest of the country. So it's two very interesting cities, both capitals at one time or another and each with their own character. This is Peter the Great. And uh, he is, as I say, the founder of St. Petersburg. And so we're going to start in St. Petersburg. Elaine and I uh, actually went to Russia by train rather than flying in. We started in uh, Central Europe uh, in, uh, or Western Europe uh, in Holland and uh, went through the Scandinavian countries, took a ferry to Finland and then a train from Helsinki to St. Petersburg. This is our hotel, which is in sort of a Russian style, but it's actually a Marriott. We were there in 2009, so it was uh, 30 years after the fall of communism. And um, so that uh, they, they've certainly become much more uh, friendly and uh, uh, invite, you know, with Western uh, 
companies and so on doing business in Russia. And so here's the interior of our room, which is, of course, uh, more like a Scandinavian hotel and less like something that somebody might know from the Soviet era. And the view out our window, you can see some of the older sort of uh, uh, more uh, Soviet style apartment buildings and so on. Um, another view of the room, these were people across, uh, they were fixing a television antenna, but it looked very precarious. It was very entertaining for uh, to, to see whether they'd fall off. Fortunately, they did not. Anyway, a typical street scene in St. Petersburg. And uh, you can see here modern Western cars, things like Toyotas or um, uh, German automobiles. And this is a Greek or, or sorry, Russian Orthodox church. And one of the things about when the communists took over in 1919 was that they did not destroy all the churches. Although they officially um, condemned religion, uh, which Karl Marx uh, was, did not approve of, they uh, recognized that the art involved in these buildings and the craftsmanship were the product of Russian laborers, which of course the Communist Party as a workers party wanted to celebrate. So a lot of the churches were not torn down and they were ma maintained as museums. And then since the fall of communism, uh, some of them have now been reconsecrated as Russian Orthodox churches and others they've started a um, renovation and maintenance projects to bring them back to their uh, former glory. So uh, a lot of the old Orthodox churches are um, still there and still open to visit. This is a Soviet era well, convenience store. You see they display the food in the windows and then you have to uh, purchase it through the little cubby hole in the wall there. And you can see the rusted out Lada sitting on the uh, in front of it, sort of uh, reminiscent of what it was about 30 or 40 years ago. This is more what it's like now. You can see what looks to be a bank building from the Tsarist era, which has been remade as a McDonald's restaurant. This is the campus of the uh, St. Petersburg University. It's a very elegant campus. The buildings are very well maintained. Uh, among the graduates was Vladimir Putin, who is from St. Petersburg. This is another part of the university campus. And it's down by the uh, river, which uh, you can look across the river. And what we're looking at here is the St. Peter and Paul Church, which is part of the uh, fortress of St. Petersburg, or if you want to use a term, Kremlin. We often hear the word Kremlin and we think of it as a government building in Moscow, but a better translation would be more like Citadel, similar to what we have in Quebec City or in Halifax. It's a sort of military fortification with a lot of important buildings inside, which could include military buildings, but also royal buildings and religious buildings. Remember, these things were built during a time when uh, church and state were sort of hard to distinguish. And so uh, it would be very important to have the uh, your important religious people uh, very close to the uh, government of Russia. And so that, uh, that you see, it's not uncommon to see a church in what looks to be a military base. And over here, another picture of the university campus. This is the dissident Andrei Sakharov, who no longer uh, is somebody that they are persecuting, but he had been, uh, with the fall of communism, he had been celebrated. Looking across the river in the other direction, this is the Hermitage, uh, which is now a very famous art museum. It was formerly one of the palaces of the Tsars, the Winter Palace. And it is an amazing building uh, in terms of its size and in terms of its elegance. And this is the Admiralty building, the uh, uh, Russian Navy headquarters. You can see that the uh, St. Petersburg was built on what was essentially swamp land. So you can see how the uh, river is almost the same height as the um, ground and there's no hills or anything in the distance. And you can see there's very little clearance under the bridges. So these are all lift bridges that have to lift up to let the boats in into the river. 
and another view of the Hermitage. You can also see the uh, elegant, uh, obviously not Soviet, but czarist era design on the metalwork of the bridge. And I could not resist a rainbow came out over the Hermitage. So I have to include this picture. This is the interior of the Hermitage. And you can imagine when the peasants and workers uh, staged a revolution in 1919 and stormed this building and saw the extreme uh, elegance and opulence uh, that the, of the czars, uh, how they um, obviously reacted um, with, with, you know, very uh, emotionally uh, and uh, were very, very, uh, outraged at the amount of money that the uh, royal family was wasting while other people were living in poverty. This is now one of the best museums in the world. Uh, again, the communists took over. They recognized the cultural value of this and uh, did not destroy these things, but protected them as a museum to belong to the people. Uh, First of all, you have the royal art collection of the czars of Russia, which was very, very impressive. Then what they have are all of the pieces of art that were confiscated from the wealthy people living in Russia that when, when they took over uh, and uh, uh, they confiscated all of the wealth of the business class in Russia. And then they've also got all of the art that the Russians stole from the Nazis who stole it from other people that they uh, uh, conquered in, in Europe. And um, a lot of this stuff has not been returned but is on display in the um, museum in St. Petersburg. Just an amazing building, very, very elegant. And of course, in World War II, this was uh, part of the siege of Leningrad, lasted about 900 days. People were starving and uh, allegedly eating wallpaper and, and so on. Uh, and this building, of course, would have uh, been uh, badly damaged and has been restored to its elegance. Uh, you could literally spend several days there. And it's a very comprehensive museum. This is a, uh, a prehistoric uh, collection. And the woodwork on the floor is incredible, as well as the um, moldings and, and uh, plaster work on the ceilings. Some examples of ceramics. This is the square in front of the former palace, a uh, site of a very famous uh, massacre at, at the, by, under the uh, armies of the Tsar. And so it's very refreshing. What we see here are some school children, presumably on a visit to the museum, and they actually seem to be uh, in some sort of round dance, uh, actually enjoying themselves. So it's nice to see that uh, I, I think uh, the future of Russia has some positive things going on with the younger generation. As I say, this was built uh, to be an elegant city by the uh, Saint, uh, sorry, the Tsar Peter the Great. And it was also built on an area at the uh, mouth of the river right by the Baltic Sea where in lowlands. And so the city has a lot of canals, very much like you might have anticipated in Venice. And these canals go uh, through the, uh, among some very elegant buildings. This is the Stroganoff mansion. They were famous for the beef Stroganoff developed by their chef. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of other great mansions, many of which have now become government office buildings. We took a tour. This is our tour guide. And I got to see several of the places uh, from a different vantage point than you would if you saw them on land, the Admiralty building there, and some uh, buildings of the campus of the uh, university. So very strong contrast to sort of the dour image that you might have of the Soviet Union, or even the image of Moscow today. So this is the fortress, the uh, citadel, uh, which would have been the place of the residence of the Tsar uh, during um, the uh, Tsarist era. Uh, so you've got a dock on the river entering into the palace. You can see the double-headed eagle, which is the symbol of the Tsar's royal family. And this has been 
uh, you know, reinstalled since the fall of the communists. And this is inside the um, Kremlin grounds, in the grounds of the um, uh, palace of the uh, Tsar uh, Peter the Great and his descendants. A very, very pleasant place to visit, people wandering around in a very friendly and uh, generally happy mood. And some very beautiful buildings. So here you can see uh, Russian tourists enjoying the uh, area. There are various chairs uh, and uh, with different artistic uh, things on them and people are, you know, sit in the chairs and take each other's picture. And uh, this is us having lunch. The um, game that they're playing here seems to be a uniquely Russian game. I don't know how it works. It's sort of like bowling, except that you throw a club at, a, at some uh, wooden blocks that are set up at the end. And you can see this poster shows the different formations of the blocks, and they're each worth different points as you knock them down. And these people are dressed as uh, Peter the Great and um, uh, one of his descendants, Catherine the Great, and they will greet you when you show up at their palace. And, and uh, they let us wander around. We could wander through the various areas up on the roof, which, you know, the former ramparts when it was a military base. And you can see the czarist flag flying from there looks similar to a Union Jack. And this is the uh, sort of the barracks area and some uh, guns on display, World War II era guns. Of course, we were allies with Russia in World War II and so, and they suffered a lot. A lot of lives were lost on Russian uh, civilians and so that they uh, commemorate uh, the uh, end of World War II and the victory uh, very patriotically. And you'll see a lot of references to that. This is the church uh, in the background, which is extremely elegant. This is the official church of the Tsars when the capital was in St. Petersburg. And it is in a Baroque style, very, very lavish ornamentation. And the graves of the czars, this is the official place where all the czars are buried. Now, of course, the medieval czars are buried in Moscow in a church there. But anybody from the time of Peter the Great on, which is in the 1700s, all of the rest of the royal family are buried in this church. And uh, very elegant uh, memorial to them, of course. This is Anastasia, who was the youngest daughter of Tsar Nicholas, the last Tsar who was killed in 1919. Some people had speculated that she had escaped. Uh, and we now know that um, they, when they found the bodies after, again, after the fall of the communists, and they did DNA testing uh, with uh, Prince Philip to, uh, to uh, verify that it was indeed the royal family. And indeed, Anastasia died with the rest of the family. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, the um, memorial stone. This is the grave of the family of Nicholas II. This is a church of a totally different style. This is in a medieval Russian Orthodox style, and it's the church of the uh, spilled blood because it's built on the site of an assassination to memorialize, uh, I think it was Alexander II who was killed there. And it is extremely elaborate in the um, uh, Orthodox style and a uh, lot of um, paintings uh, and uh, mosaics and an extremely lavish interior. This is looking up to the Jesus's picture at the top of the dome. And you can see the chandeliers and all of the other decoration. It is just very, very beautiful church. And obviously a totally different style than the Baroque church we saw earlier. And here is a classical church. This is the church of St. Isaac. And, um, it has been again restored to its original condition. It is, uh, you know, it rivals the Vatican and churches in Vienna in terms of its um, quality of its artwork. 
the columns, the green columns are made of malachite, which is a semi-precious stone. Uh, it is, uh, you know, just just uh, one uh, an amazing building. And this is the main street in uh, St. Petersburg, the main business street. We're looking up to the Admiralty building at the end of the street. This is a um, former office building. Uh, I believe it's a Singer building, the Singer Sewing Machine Company. And this is a large, uh, basically, um, department store that was uh, very uh, lavish during the era of the czars and then of course fell into you know a time of scarcity and has now been restored to its uh, former glory and uh, also a large uh, theater for live theater and ballet the central theater in St. Petersburg and again on these grounds you have uh, people dressing in character to welcome the tourists. They didn't know a lot of English, uh, so when they spoke to us in Russian and we were polite in English, they, the only things they knew were welcome to St. Petersburg. So it was still a friendly greeting. And uh, beautiful gardens outside, uh, and, and again, some of the uh, metal work and other things. St. Petersburg is a very elegant city. This is a picture of uh, Tsar Nicholas, uh, Tsar Peter the Great. And uh, th th this uh, statue is just by the waterfront commemorating the founder of the city. And uh, just some other people and other statues. Here's uh, Peter as a boat builder. Uh, he learned the craft of making wooden boats when he was in Holland. And uh, so this is again, you know, a, um, a commemoration of uh, a, a person who was very revered in, and remains revered in Russian history. And uh, this is a uh, his restaurant in a authentic old Russian style. And here's some samples of Russian food. And uh, some of it's very similar to what we're familiar with, with Ukrainian food here. But one of the things impressed me is it is based on ingredients that are available in their climate and grown locally and can be easily preserved over the winter. So that soup, for instance, is uh, made with, um, uh, you've got like things like olives that you might purchase, uh, uh, you know, as preserved food. And uh, they, they make, uh, use a, a yogurt base, they use a beer base, and they use vinegar bases for a variety of different types of food. And these are little dumplings, similar to um, uh, what you might have in Ukrainian cuisine, similar to a pierogi. And some other examples, salads like beet salad and potato salad, again, based on the um, uh, crops which would grow in that region. Uh, some just variations in the same thing. Of course, we're familiar with fish and chips. Both of these dishes are fish and potato dishes, but you can see that even with these basic food types, they can prepare them in a variety of different and interesting ways. This, sorry for the quality of this, but it was a telephoto shot in a dark railway station. But what it is, is a uh, large uh, mural on the wall of the station that shows a schematic of the entire Russian railway system with St. Petersburg at the top. And if you can sort of see it, you can see the word St. Petersburg. It's written in Cyrillic, but pronounced as a German word, Petersburg and Moscow is here. And we took the train from St. Petersburg to Moscow. This is the uh, poster for the train with the train schedule. And um, at the bottom, it's got little symbols representing the different cities along the route from St. Petersburg to Moscow. And this is a very fast express train. It took, in, you know, instead of all day, it took a few hours. They did check our um, identity or, uh, our visas because of course we were going from one city to another. And here are some of the rural areas along the route between the two. You can see a small Orthodox church there 
and this is a station in the middle and i don't have a picture this is a picture out the window of the train uh people were selling mushrooms and other uh local products from the forest there uh berries and so on they were selling them to people on the train when when a train stopped Okay, so this is our hotel in Moscow, and it, what it is is a large multi-purpose building with private residences along the front and commercial along the uh, bottom. And uh, to get into the hotel, you've got to go in through that archway that might have been a, a carriageway back when this was built maybe a hundred years ago. Uh, and you can see some signs there. Fortunately, we looked all this stuff up on the internet so that we knew uh, how to find it because it almost feels like you're in some sort of uh, secret uh, hideout. You've got to go through this space and that you go to here. Here's actually a sign uh, telling us that the hotel is there. Into this back lane and then you go to the third door and you ring and they buzz you in and you go up a darkened staircase to the top floor. But it turned out that it was totally renovated, fairly modern. The rooms were not large, but they were quite comfortable. We had a view of a tree out our window and uh, we enjoyed this very well. And it was only about two or three blocks from uh, Red Square. So it was a quite convenient location as well. And so leaving our hotel, walking towards the downtown Red Square area, we come to one of the elegant shopping streets of Moscow. This would be where your oligarchs would be able to shop and you've got your elegant stores that you might expect to find in London or Paris or New York. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, sidewalk cafes and uh, other things that make it quite a pleasant environment to be. Uh, there's a statue on the left. What is interesting also is the painting on the right. It is a replica of one of the paintings in the Russian Art Museum that is in Moscow. And they have these scattered around the city to advertise the museum. And they uh, tell you that who the artist is and that you can come and see more if you um, come to the museum. So it's a very good use of street art to make the street a little more uh, elegant and interesting and also to publicize the museum itself. You can see this is the Cartier store, one of the examples of the uh, newly elegant uh, post-Soviet Russia. And uh, Burberry, another high-end brand. Uh, the model, by the way, is Emma Watson from uh, Harry Potter. This is the Bolshoi Theater, the home of the famous Bolshoi Ballet, and it was under reconstruction. And one of the interesting things is over the scaffolding, they put canvas with a picture of what the front of the building looks like. So you can almost imagine you're looking at the real building, even though it's all surrounded by scaffolding during the renovation. And uh, one of the things, again, is in that they are somewhat now open to the Western world, uh, they're on the regular tourist circuit of uh, major performers. This is Itzhak Perlman, the viol violinist. And if you can read Cyrillic, that's exactly what the name says. And here, this is a shopping mall very close to the um, uh, Kremlin. Uh, and uh, it, oh, on, oh, the mall is underground and on top of the mall is a large and uh, fairly pleasant park with fountains and so on. The Metropole Hotel, which was very famous as a place where Westerners stayed during the Soviet era. And this is a quote from Lenin. Uh, I cannot read Russian. Elaine, you once looked that up. Do you have any memory of what this said? Mm, guess not, okay. Um, we also went to a museum. This is a, uh, again, another World War II gun. Uh, and it was a museum that during the era of the Soviets was a museum to celebrate uh, the accomplishments of the Soviet Union. Uh, and rather than destroying the memory of this era, they retained the museum as a uh, museum of 20th century history. And so that uh, even though that era is over, uh, it is still possible to see a lot of uh, artifacts and, uh, you know, propaganda posters, things of that sort uh, from uh, the 20th century. A couple of things. One propaganda poster was a World War II propaganda poster, which was 
of course, the common enemy was Germany. And so it was a poster showing friendship with the British Commonwealth. And another thing I saw there was a, um, a hockey uh, commemoration, uh, like Vladimir Trechek's hockey shirt and, and, and so on. And these are things, of course, that Canadians identify with quite well. Main street, uh, uh, in main business street in Moscow, very bustling center. Again, you can see the advertising for Hyundai, which is a South Korean. Uh, so again, the fact that they're theoretically were an ally with the North Koreans, uh, they're now more concerned with the, uh, the, the part of Korea that is more prosperous. This is a uh, Kazakh restaurant, and I regret we did not go there. We wish we had, but it shows some in the same way that we have restaurants, say, from uh, uh, people who immigrate to here uh, because of the uh, relation of Kazakhstan to Russia and the Soviet Union. Uh, there's a lot of Central Asian immigrants to Moscow, and uh, some of the culture is represented there. And again, one of the parks in Moscow one of the old um, uh, mansions from the Soviet, from the Tsarist era that uh, then became a Soviet uh, government office building. This is a monument to the um, monk that uh, invented the Cyrillic alphabet, which is of course the alphabet they use in Eastern Europe and Russia, and a uh, remnant of the old medieval wall, the, the city walls that, that used to exist and some other medieval era buildings that, as I say, the uh, medieval capital was Moscow. So these buildings are older than anything you would see in St. Petersburg. Uh, Orthodox Church, which has been uh, maintained in good condition. And you can see the smokestacks from a, a factory that date from a more industrial 20th century era. Another one of the older churches. This is the art museum. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the inside. They don't want us taking pictures of the art, uh, but you can see it's in sort of a uh, Russian style of design, which almost looks Oriental or Asian, which is of course the Central Asian influence in Moscow. And outside the museum in a sculpture garden, some very interesting and contemporary sculpture. Unlike the Hermitage, which as I say, is a collection of art that mostly from Western Europe, uh, this museum highlighted art done by Russian artists in the uh, 19th and 20th centuries. A lot of artists that uh, we've never heard of, but uh, we're following a lot of the same friends uh, that, uh, you know, that France or Germany or other parts of Europe went through over the last couple of hundred years. And uh, again, some Russian street scenes, ordinary people just like us and uh, a, a fairly pleasant place. We felt very safe to wander, some young people busking. And like we saw in South America, a lot of the dogs are not tied up. They wander loose the way we might let our cats out. And uh, they don't seem to bother anybody. They sleep most of the day like a dog, a domestic dog would. This is the Kremlin, again, as seen from the um, park adjacent to it. And uh, this is the Kremlin walls. And again, in Soviet era, you can imagine what trouble you'd get with if you were uh, playing on the wall of the Kremlin. So it's, I find it encouraging to see that young people have a, a more uh, li liberated attitude uh, one of the Soviet era called Soviet Gothic office buildings, uh, huge buildings built under the Stalinist era. And uh, again, some uh, fountains and gardens that were part of the ad adjacent area. I'm going around the there's, Kremlin's got on three sides. One is the river, one is this park, and the third side is Red Square. And again, some uh, exposure to Western culture. They had a uh, Scottish uh, military tattoo that was being uh, performed 
in Moscow and there's an advertisement for it. Very nice gardens, very elegant. This is a skylight over the shopping center, which serves also as a sculpture in the park. And you can see it's, it's a map of the world and it's visible from both sides. And beyond that's known as the White House. It's the Russian uh, legislature building. And these are the uh, looking towards the uh, Red Square, these uh, medieval era buildings. These are the gates to Red Square. And you can see uh, St. Basil's or Vasily in Russian, the church beyond, which is a medieval church. It's probably the greatest medieval church in Russia. And it's just captivating. I couldn't get my eyes off it or stop taking pictures of it. It's absolutely amazing. Like there are nine towers and every one is a different design. And inside there are nine separate chapels. It's a three by three grid and each one is totally distinct in its uh, architecture. This is um, one of the uh, towers on the wall of the Kremlin. And this is the Kremlin as viewed from the river. We're going to get inside in a minute. You can see churches in there. And in many ways, again, you think of a Kremlin as a large government office building. It reminds me more, if you had to find a parallel, uh, to Vatican City in that it's, while it's a separate walled in area, it has uh, parkland and churches and open plazas and is actually a fairly pleasant place to visit. Red Square, in the background you have Lenin's tomb, and these are of course Russian uh, soldiers uh, who seem a lot less threatening than they used to. And um, we encountered them there, another building with it under renovation with its facade on the scaffolding. And again, the um, tower of the, gates of the Kremlin. This is the GUM or G-U-M, it's a department store and a very elegant uh, czarist era, era building, uh, long, like the elegant department stores in 19th century Belle Epoque, France. It was very famous during the Soviet era for uh, having long lines and very inferior produce. Uh, but now it's again been redone. Uh, Russia has become more prosperous, more open to a free market. And uh, it, it's just a, you know, a very pleasant and interesting place to stroll and look at the merchandise. Have lunch, visit, sit around. Very nice uh, renovation to this building. The medieval gates to the Red Square were taken down by the Soviets so they could get the tanks into the Red Square for their military parades. And uh, under the um, current post-Soviet government, uh, respect for Russian history and uh, going back, uh, and they rebuilt the old medieval gates to look the same as they used to. And uh, this is just in front of the gates, people selling balloons and other things uh, to celebrate Russian Flag Day was apparently the occasion. And so, uh, we are now looking, we are now in the Kremlin grounds. That is a government office building that is closed to the public, but you can see other people are just strolling around and taking pictures of each other. And these are some of the churches. And what it is, is there are about a half dozen of them. And this being the center of the Russian capital, the palace of the Tsar was here and the walls that protected the Tsar. And so each monastic order of the Russian Orthodox Church had its uh, what you might consider to be representation to the royal government. And so each one of these churches represents a different medieval monastic order. And, and that's why there are so many of them. They did not let us take pictures inside, but you can see again, it's in the Orthodox style and you've got some murals and onion domes and other things that are familiar to uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox churches here in Saskatchewan. And in one of these churches is where all the czars prior to Peter the Great are buried. And you can go in and see those tombs and memorials as well. One of the other buildings which I did not get a, take a picture inside is called the Armory. 
and it is uh, a museum of armory, meaning it's a museum of suits of armor and coats of arms. And um, it's full of um, a lot of work, which were gifts from the uh, various ambassadors to the court. And so all of those gifts that went to the czar have been saved and they're now on museum. One of the display cases had five um, Fabergé eggs and they weren't the most impressive thing in that display case. And that wasn't the most impressive display case in the museum. Uh, the one I thought which was most impressive was a lot of uh, uh, hand done uh, metal work, you know, uh, vessels and plates and things uh, that were uh, done in gold and uh, very, very ornate. And so that's a museum that you can visit there. Some other pictures on the Kremlin grounds. This is a bell that was supposed to be the biggest bell in the world. And like the American Liberty Bell, it's cracked. And it's sometimes known as the Russian Liberty Bell. Uh, it obviously never got mounted on the building where it was supposed to be, but they keep it as a um, uh, piece of art in, in the Kremlin grounds. And the same with this huge ornate ceremonial cannon, which again was not intended to be fired, but you can see the size of that thing. And the size of the cannonballs are just incredible. So an interesting piece of Russian history. And again, who would have thought this is a picture of the Kremlin? Very pleasant park. This is inside the Kremlin grounds. Looking out, you can see the Kremlin walls and the tower beyond and the river. So uh, to end, we're going to go inside uh, St. Basil's, which, as, as I say, is an extremely ornate building with nine separate chapels. This is a memorial to the St. Vasily. Uh, and some of the floors, which are metalwork, and some of the uh, just the uh, extremely ornate decoration, the traditional Orthodox icons, of which there are many in here, and then the way in which each individual chapel is is decorated in its own fashion. Some were under renovation, and some have been completely renovated by now. bring back the medieval uh, ceiling decorations. And again, as a traditional Orthodox church with the uh, picture of Christ at the top of the dome. They had a choir there that was actually selling CDs of uh, Russian religious music. And of course the acoustics were incredible. And you could do a whole study of the symbolism of, of Russian icons. And uh, some of them are familiar Bible stories to those of us in the West and others are more particular to um, stories of Russian saints and so on who we'd be unfamiliar with. You can see the Last Supper at the top right. One of the things we saw a lot of is uh, Russian wedding parties. It seems that one of the big things to do is to have your formal wedding pictures taken in front of St. Basil's. And so that these people would show up with their family and uh, photographers and uh, their wedding party and uh, be posing for pictures. And the other thing we're seeing here is scaffolding being set up for a musical event that uh, uh, people, you know, like rock and roll singers that used to be banned in the Soviet era now routinely give performances with the Kremlin as the background to their stage set. And so like Paul McCartney comes and sings back in the USSR and things like that, which are extremely ironic. It does show that things can change for the better, even though sometimes you wonder whether it ever will. And so now we're on a train, we're taking the train to the airport to come home. And so again, this is some pictures of the suburbs of Moscow. You can see some apartment type buildings. You can see some smaller, lower density buildings. As we uh, go to, through the, uh, the airports, of, you know, obviously a few miles out of town. And I'm going to end. There's some pictures of Russian money. Those are bills in rubles. 
and um, you can see obviously there's pictures of famous Russian monuments on them. So it was a very interesting visit, uh, especially in, you know, because we have a lot of suspicions even today of what Russia is like. And it's nice to go there. Uh, we felt very comfortable walking around and uh, the people were very friendly and helpful and we enjoyed ourselves very much. A lot of churches. <laughs> yeah, uh, and of course, it's like visiting Italy because it was the center of the Orthodox Church, just as Italy's, you know, if you go to Rome, there's a church every block. <laughs> so the one, there was one that had very, very gold uh, tops. Yeah. Uh, is that gold? Um, I don't know. I mean, originally it would have, they, some of them, like the one that the Tsar's church, they probably did use real gold leaf. I'm sure some of them are trying to appear gold with paint. Okay. So you were there when, Gail? I was there 2005 in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and then 2018, I took the Trans-Siberian. So I was in Moscow just that time. So but, what was your reaction in 2005? Oh, it was, it was, Moscow was very Asian, very backwards. And, uh, but in 2018, uh, they'd had the world soccer there, the World Cup. And so all the signs were in English. Everything had been cleaned up. It was almost like a European city, night and day. Yeah, we noticed that when we were there, I guess, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, like we went to one museum and uh, they had two guided tours, one in Russian and one in English. And so all the Chinese and German tourists would take the English tour. It was the common language. And so uh, even not that everybody spoke English, but there was usually a tour guide who could help you. Yeah. Uh, and well, uh, even the subway, the subway in 2005 was all Russian and Cyrillic. You, you, mm -hmm. you didn't even know where you were going. And now it's all English. But of course, that was the World Cup. They just yeah. changed it. Yeah. A lot of building. In that sense, it reminds me of Tokyo, which obviously is clearly, uh, you know, all their traditional languages looks more like Chinese, but they have uh, the Russian, uh, the Roman alphabet, they call it, Romanji. Uh, signage that uh, we can read in English in the subway yeah, in Tokyo. One thing is it was a happier time then. I think, you know, there's been a lot more back and forth with Russian and Putin. So I think if you went there now, it wouldn't be as happy as it, everything seemed happy when we were there. I, I, I bet it's, you know, not as happy these days, but that's, I don't know. Yeah, it, well, obviously with the, <laughs> Yeah, it, I'm guessing it's like what the United States was when Trump was in office. Uh, but I, I do feel that like looking at the younger generation that we saw that, that they've got more optimism and a sense of independence and, uh, you, you know, that, that, they're, that the seeds of improvement are there. 